Amen. Got to see the rain pour, pouring down. Just a great, great day. And the more rain, the merrier. Amen. We had a glorious service at Magnolia Campus today. If this even comes near it, we're just going to have a hallelujah time. And I hope you already are. Amen. What an awesome privilege to get together on Sunday mornings just to meet with God and to meet with God's people and have a great time of fellowship and ministry together. It just doesn't get any better than this. Amen? Y'all need to wake up. Somebody say amen. Punch the person next to you and say, wake up. We're going to have church. Run ground rule, remember. Don't be dead. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I, uh, I'm preaching a message that if you got your newsletter on Friday or Saturday, was in the newsletter. If you didn't get it Friday or Saturday, you'll probably get Monday or Tuesday, depending on your mail delivery person and how that gets sorted in your particular zip code. But I uh, reprinted in the newsletter what was I've been handed and seen called, uh, in fact, it's the, it's the message title day called 10 Ways to Kill Your Church. How to Kill Your Church. And I thought this was printed in 1959 when it was originally printed. And I thought, boy, this is so appropriate to, you know, uh, not just... 59, 69, 79, 89, or whatever, you know, 99, 2009, but decades later, how relevant this little particular article was. Now, if you're a visitor here today, this is, you know, I usually don't just kind of preach little spot sermons like this. We're usually involved in, in deep study of the Word of God and chapter and verses and those kind of things. But we just finished 16, 18 weeks on the miracles of Jesus. What a great study as we just discovered the, the, the Lord, His ministry, the personality, the character the grace in which Jesus came and which he ministered and the hope that came to that for us and how it applies to our life today. In fact, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday, I started a new series on the end times apostasy of the last days. We'll be looking specifically at the book of Jude and a lot of Second Peter, but mostly at the book of Jude. So if you want to get a little ahead of the game, read the book of Jude this next week. It's not that long. It's one chapter long. But we'll spend about eight weeks there as we just dig into it and see just how relevant that book on apostasy was to where we are today in the church and in the world and in the culture we live in. We'll see, boy, we're very close to the Lord's return. Amen. And it could be just any day now. So we'll be preaching out of that as well. But I just couldn't pass this up. It was so good. In fact, so good, as I said, I, I not only, you know, uh, put it in the newsletter, I just took it upon myself to make a sermon out of it and preach it because it really is relevant. And it's 10, 10 ways to kind of get you where we're at. Let me just say right now, I know it's going to get, I'm making a little noise right now and trying to get you to make a little noise because I know how quiet it's going to get in just a minute. <laughs> See, how do you know that? I just preached it just a while ago. So I have practiced what I preach here in double trouble. But, <laughs> but it's 10 relevant points that, uh, that talk about the church and the death of churches. We've been really blessed. We celebrate 25 years as a church. Praise the Lord. We ought to praise the Lord for that this year. And our great celebration planning party had met, our, and we're just, we just got a, a big lollapalooza, that's Greek, by the way, of, uh, of a great celebration day set up for the last Sunday in September. And I shared with the committee just the other night when we met about churches and what a blessing it was to be able to celebrate 25 years. Recent research shows that Anywhere from 3,500 to 4,500 churches close the doors every year in America. That's a lot of churches, wouldn't you agree? A lot of them are new church starts. Most churches that start, like we started 25 years ago, never get past the first, second, third year. And usually about seven or eight out of ten fall in the category, just, they can't, it just didn't happen. And then there's many other churches that just naturally die, not that God wants them to, but that they allowed it. You know, I've, I've used to tell them back when I was in evangelism, doing revivals church to church, you know, that some of their churches were dead, but they were too poor, so they couldn't have a funeral. So, <laughs> couldn't afford the funeral. And there, there's a lot of churches that are dead and probably need to be buried, but haven't. But there are many more churches, and it is heartbreaking in the long run. You never want to see the work of God hindered or, or stopped on any level. I just wish every church would succeed and that every church would just, you know, be Jesus-centered and, and the power of God and the grace of God would rest upon churches, but it doesn't always happen. But the culprit, I, I believe God closes some, like the children of Israel wandered around 40 years in the wilderness and God didn't let that generation go in, did he? So I believe there's some that God just says, that's enough. There's some, I think, that are, it's death by their own hand. It's like, you know, spiritual suicide of the church. They just kill themselves without realizing what they're doing. 
uh, we don't have any plans at Believer's Fellowship on doing that. Amen. We're not finished. Amen. We're just beginning. Amen. I mean, we're going to rededicate, recommit ourselves to the task annually and daily if necessary for us to be what God's called us to be and for us to do what God wants us to do. We're, we're not going to, uh, you know, expire. We're going to prespire and, and keep pressing on and be what, what the Lord has raised us up to be. But I do suspect that the death of most churches occur for a, a, a few simple reasons and oftentimes many avoidable reasons. But we don't want to be a part of that. So I, I, I preach this today because, you know, you, you may be like one guy who said to me as we left the service a while ago, said you gave 10 reasons. I want to apologize personally. I'm guilty of seven of those reasons for killing a church. I don't know if you want to keep your own tally this morning or not, but I would hope that this message, as it comes across, will come across as a way to, to uh, really for introspection to say, hey, I love my church. I love what God's doing in, in, in our fellowship and in our body, and I want to see it succeed. I, I want our church to be everything God wants it to be, amen? And I want it to succeed the way God wants us to succeed. So look at these from, from perhaps a obvious a, you know, an overview. We can see why churches die and why a lot of churches close their doors, but even more specifically, personally. Let's look at it and see where we might be perhaps guilty in some regard. And if, if something hits home, say, oh, me, amen, do something, amen, just don't stay the same. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Let me get my little, get my finger on the right button because I'm always pushing the wrong button. Let's go through this, how to kill your church, all right? Number one, pretty simple reason, don't come. If you want your church to die, just don't come. I mean, one of the biggest church killers in the world is waning attendance. It just starts lagging off. And churches go through these cycles where that happens and revival has to come and must come or that continues to be a deal. So the way to kill your church, you know, is just don't come. It's easy to find excuses for not coming to church. Oh, well, you know, the baby's got a runny nose or, you know, my back hurts or the weather's not right or whatever it might be. You know, we just don't come. I wonder what it would look like at your house or my house if God didn't show up or if God showed up the way I show up at his house. You know, what would, what would be like that? The Bible's very clear, and you don't have to read much of the New Testament to discover that the church, and specifically the local church, is a very important. It's the way God is reaching the world. It's the way God's plan is. It's, people say, well, I don't like organized religion. Well, that means you're not really excited about God because he's the one who organized it, all right? He's the one who put the church together. Amen. He structured it the way he structured it, the leadership he structured it. That all comes from God. We didn't think this up. And it's our desire, Believer's Fellowship, to stay as New Testament as we possibly can in every regard. Because it is important what we're doing. But if you want to kill it, just don't show up. Don't be a part of it. Number two. Oh, did I not say it? Excuse me. If you do come, make sure you come late. So how does that kill the church? I want to ask our guests to stand. Tim asked them to remain seated, and you got to meet some of our guests. But I wasn't here at the beginning because I was at the other campus. But you can be sure most of our guests not only arrived on time, they showed up early. Maybe that was because they wanted to see how crazy you were, to see if they could slip out before it started. I don't know. But most of our guests come early. Now, First impressions are everything, right? Yes. Amen. First impressions are everything. So if you're a guest here today and you see people kind of wandering in and wandering in, there's 20 people here, and there's 30 people, and there's 100 people, and there's 100 people, and you kind of slowly builds like that, that doesn't speak well for us as your host. And I apologize as, as the pastor here. I tell them all the time to come early. I tell, do, do I not? Amen. It's a, don't I remind them often about this? All right, so if you, if you want to make a bad impression, if you want your church to make a bad impression, be that person who kind of lulls. And one of the lady came to me at the invitation today at the other campus. She said, listen, I'm always late. I, I have been wrong. I realize that. And I, I want you, by the grace of God, I'm going to do a better job getting here before service starts because I don't want to be that way. And I, I, that was so notable and so honorable on her part to have that kind of humility in regard to this. But, you know, we, we're here to reach the world, amen? It starts with us right here in this community of reaching those people around us. And so we want to make, you know, we, first of all, we want, to, we want to be pleasing to the Lord. I mean, we don't want to have this I'll get there when I get there attitude when it comes to church. Let me just ask you this. Is God more important than your job? 
is what God sent his son to die for more important than your job. We are who he died for. We are the bride. We are his bride, all right? But if I can consistently be on time for work and consistently be late for God's house, what does that say about me? That says my, my priorities are way out of order. I'm just, I am behind the, the deal here. So we need to refresh these things in our heart and mind and realize, well, I, yeah, I have gotten lax in this and I have gotten lazy in this. And I, well, I've got teenagers. Well, bless your heart, we've all had them. <laughs> Amen. And we all, you know, I make out, we were all were one for the most part, many of us, all right? Just get their little behinds up earlier. Well, you know how hard it is. I'll come over. I'll show you how I got mine out of bed. Can you spell water? Can you spell ice water? It works like a charm in the bed and the sheets will dry out. It's no big deal. It doesn't hurt them at all. Amen. Whatever it takes, amen, that's what I say. Let's, let's get the ball rolling. This is God's day. This is God's church. We're God's bride. Let's be excited about it. If I was excited about that as I was about getting to work on time or just concerned about that, woo, you know, how many of us would still be employed if we had re related to our jobs that way? But a, a really, folks, honestly, a lack of punctuality when it comes to worship and being in the house of God is kind of a microcosm of our overall view of God. You know, and we try to teach that to our children, but we need to also realize that in our own heart life. It's that type of attitude of just saying, I'll get there when I get there, it's no big deal, that kills a church. It really kills a church, and it kills people who are, wanting, are looking for churches, what kind of church they want to be a part of. Number three, only show up when the weather is good. I want to pat you folks on the back, amen? You done good today. Aren't you glad you came on this particular Sunday when it was raining? Uh, it was raining a lot earlier than this over in Magnolia. It started over there and then it came over here. But uh, we, we had a house full in spite of the weather. I had to pat them all on the back. We had, you know, just, it was just a great group of folks and they came and participated. Yeah, and they didn't like point number two either, okay? <laughs> but the idea that, you know, if you get the idea that you, just got, you, know, that you can't come when the weather's bad and something's wrong with your spiritual mentality of what, what we're really doing here and what we're really all about. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been to church in a driving rainstorm? Most folks haven't either. <laughs> oh, it's too wet. I might get wet. You've heard me say before, you know, it takes 300 gallons of water to baptize one of you and two drops of rain to keep you awake. Don't be a fair weather Christian. Just get there, show up, praise the Lord, be excited, come in shaking you off wet, it doesn't matter, amen? We don't want to be that kind of person that kills the church with our, our attitude that we're just kind of this fair weather Christian. Number four, find fault with everything and or everyone. How many of y'all watch some of these homicide TV shows like CSI and all that kind of stuff? You know, when they start those homicide investigations on those TV shows, the first questions are something like this to the surrounding people. Are, have they been having any arguments or difficulties with anybody? Because the first people they want to investigate in the murder are those who had a problem with the person. And unfortunately, that's what kills a lot of churches. They have a problem with somebody in the church, and then all of a sudden you've got the victim laying there on the sidewalk of the church. Usually, you know, the fault finders are the prime suspects. They're those folks that Psalms 1-1 says they sit in the seat of the scornful. You know, they're not the encouragers, you know, they're, they're the ones who, they can always spot a problem, but doesn't necessarily mean they can always solve a problem. We don't want to just spot problems. It's one thing, and I think we have any kind of level of discernment. We can spot problems. All around us, there's lots of problems, but are, are we going to be the kind of people that just doesn't see a problem, but we also see a solution, and we want to be a part of resolving that solution and saying, hey, you know, I, I can make a difference in somebody's life and someone's heart. So don't be that kind of person who just is always, you know, just against it no matter what it is. You become guilty of being a church killer. Number five, never, never, ever accept a leadership role or responsibility. That would be terrible. In fact, most people when they come to church have this renter's mentality. They take no ownership. Uh, my wife and I made a really dumb decision uh, last year, about two years ago now, and we sold our house. We we're going to sell our house, and we said, well, let's rent the house, and we buy the other house. Uh, that works for some people. It did not work for us. 
you know. But I really saw how a lot of people come to church that say, if there was anything wrong, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what time of the night it is, the renter's going to call, you know. Uh, it could be a runny toilet, and you say, did you jiggle the handle? I'll get to it tomorrow. You know, you want to just, but, you know, you're the landlord. And it's every little thing, because they, renters, for the most part, you know, some of you are renters, you live in an apartment, call them, ownership, you know, call the management, get it fixed. When you get into your own place, though, it's a different world, isn't it? Uh, the yard doesn't mow itself. The grass doesn't grow down. It grows up, you know. Uh, things need to be repaired. Things wear out. Things break. All that goes on, you know. If you have a, a house, there's responsibilities that come along with it. And you just, you gladly, because of ownership, you assume the responsibility. But a lot of people carry that mindset into the church. You know, they, they, you know it's, just, it's, it's, it's much easier to criticize than to mobilize, you know. It's much easier to point out a problem than get in there and help resolve the problem and, and be a part of, of fixing things. Now, I praise God for the most part that isn't the picture of believer's fellowship. But Seth Godin put it this way. He said, you know, no one has ever built a statue to a critic. And that's pretty smart, isn't it? You don't build statues and monuments and memorials to people who just sit around and, 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 and complain about situations. You need to be the kind of person who says, I, I don't want to be a complainer. I want to be a resolver, a reconciler. In fact, if, if you come to the 101 class, and many of you have been through our 101 class, you may not remember this, but one of the things we always make clear in our 101, and maybe we'll have another one next month, but the 101 class, we talk about, you know, uh, the church and our vision and how we started and where we're headed and our strategies for ministry. And we talk about how we're, we're established and how we function as a body, what our beliefs are. It, it's, it's about an you know, hour and a half class. We just kind of give a, in a nutshell the overall view of the church. But one thing we say in that class is and seek to reiterate is that we're always looking for leaders. We're always looking for leaders, people who want to do something for the glory of God, people who want to make a difference in the world. People not just coasting and kind of getting by. People who really want to do something that honors God. And I praise the Lord. Our church is very unique. We, we have tons of ministries of just people involved in doing stuff for the Lord. It's exciting. It's fun. It's energizing. And it's, it's life transforming, which is probably one of the reasons in 25 years we haven't had a church split. All right. It just hasn't happened because people are busy serving the Lord. They haven't got time to be busy bodies. <laughs> And, and talking about problems, they've, they've assumed little responsibilities and leadership roles. Folks, a, a congregation that's just full of followers is on life support. It's getting ready to die. And a lot of churches are built like that today even. I, I know pastors who say we don't look to any of our lay people, people who are not in full-time ministry, to do ministries. We, we hire everybody. Because, you know, if we, if we pay them, then we can demand stuff. We can, our expectations are met. But that's not the New Testament. That's not the way God, we are the body of Christ and the body is made up of individual members who've been brought together by Jesus, who, who are dwelt by the Holy Spirit, who are given spiritual gifts so that they can operate within the whole body of Christ. So find where God wants you if you're not there yet. And if you're looking for a church home, then find a church home, not to have, walk in and, and rent a, a, a place, a place in the, in the chairs, but I, I want to come to a place where I can do something for God where I can make a difference in the overall big picture of the kingdom. I want my life to mean something. And this is the way God has given us to do it. So I would say never shy away and don't run away from responsibilities and, and leadership. Number six, you still with me? Half of you, where are the others? Okay. Number six, get mad if you're not appointed to a leadership position. Too many people today, folks, so many people are focused on titles. I want to be the director. I want to be the deacon. I want to be a dignitary. Until they discover that that means servant. <laughs> Jesus says, I came to be a servant. I came to give my life. I came to serve. I came to share. And that's what real leadership is anyway. But we have seen people over the years who come in, you know, and we talk about looking for people who want to be leaders, you know, they want to come in immediately and seize some role of a position with, that has a title attached to it. And that's nothing but it kind of reveals this deep-seated pride, you know. Well, don't you know who I am mentality. Uh, that's not the way God operates. He starts with this with as humble servants of Jesus Christ. 
And it's in faithfulness and it's in, it's in humility that we, we're elevated. It's in faithfulness and it's in humility that we ultimately God brings us to places of leadership and responsibilities. The Bible puts it this way. If you're faithful in little, you'll be master over much. So it starts with a, being faithful in little. Can I just accept the title of being servant of Jesus Christ? And from there, it's amazing what God will do when people are faithful to the Lord, how he will increase their, their so-called kingdom, which is ultimately his kingdom. But God's looking for people that he can use. But if you don't get your title pointed to you, be patient, be faithful, be humble. You'll, you'll see God develop something in you that will be life transforming and also be life transforming, not just for you, but for other people as well. All right? Y'all want me to stop at six, I know. But just four more. Can you bear with that? Amen. Number seven, never give your opinion in a meeting. Wait till after the meeting. More churches have died in that kind of situation and setting than anything I know. You know, now we all have our opinions, but our opinions, you know, maybe God gave you an opinion that's sanctified and gave you an opinion that's anointed. Then it needs to be shared and it needs to be a part of the, of the process. A, a sheer fire sign of a church that's on its deathbed is, is one of those that just has major meetings after major meetings after major meetings, you know. Because a lot of people won't speak their mind, they won't share their heart, they won't share their vision. And what happens when something doesn't go their way, they have their own meeting in the parking lot after church. You know, if you're looking for the chalk lines and the outlines for the bodies, they're out there in the parking lot for some churches. Because a little after meeting, not necessarily anointed and it's not really any, there's not really any desire to communicate the overall vision, the overall health of the body. It's what my opinion is. You know, when no voices and honest opinions or offers come until after meetings, that just kills a church immediately. We just had a, you know, we don't do a lot of major meetings. We do our annual business meeting each year. Our church is an elder-driven church. Any major decision has to come, usually comes before the body, uh, like the purchasing buildings and those kind of things and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's, that's a church decision. We vote on our budget as a church, but... Uh, we do have meetings. We had a meeting just the other night. It was a planning meeting for our big celebration time. 40, 50 people here. That's the way a meeting should operate. People are sitting at tables. The creative juices were flowing. People are, there was input. There was excitement. It was fun. If you missed the meeting, you missed a blessing, you know. Our meetings aren't trivial. And our meetings aren't boring when we have those kind of meetings. It was an exciting planning time of ministry. How are we going to reach the community? How can this celebration time be a ministry? How can we touch people's lives? From everything, from how we're going to park the cars to how we're going to greet the people, how we're going to have food, fellowship, all those different things. And it, it, those were the kind of meetings that churches need to have, where people are involved and people are committed. They're, saying, they're standing and saying, what can I do? How can I help? Or here's how I think I can be a part of something. Here's, how, here's what my gift is. Here's how I can use it. And it was an exciting time. But if you're on this other category, that won't build a church. It will kill a church. Number eight. This kind of flows with the last couple. Do nothing more than absolutely necessary. You don't have to do too much. You've got things to do anyway. You, a lot of people, you know, they, they show up, they go home, but they're not active, engaged parts and of the body of Christ, you know. It, it's, it's hard to reach, folks, the, what Jesus called the least of these. It's, it's hard to reach the least of these when we're, not only, when we're, when we're only doing the least we can. It's just enough to get by. In fact, the sad reality is that most people who, who only want to do the least, they usually are the ones who love to criticize the most. They, they howl, about, howl and scream about how the church is being run and what's going on and what's the matter with this. They're kind of on the sidelines. If you're a sideline church member, then you're enabling. It. At the very least, you're an accessory to murder <laughs> when a church dies. Don't be a sideline kind of participant. You are an active part of bo the body of Jesus Christ. Be that particular part that God's called you to be. Number nine, hold back on your giving to the Lord. I know some people say, well, I'm a little upset the way the church is going. I'm just not going to give. Well, you're really not hurting the church. God's going to meet our needs and the church's needs. Amen? 
you're hurting your own self. And the Bible says, you know, it's more blessed to give than receive. That, you know, it's, it's by giving that you do receive. It's what opens the door. It's, it's what keeps the, the, the supply coming into your life. And if you kind of enter this little deal, you know, that, uh, uh, that of not giving because something may not be operating or the way you want it, or maybe you're just not a giver and you hold back, you know, that's contributing to the death of the church and the hindrance to the body of Christ. Tim Keller says that mercy ministry is very expensive. In other words, if we're really gonna be that, the ministers and the missionary, missionaries of mercy that God's called us to be, it, it, it's gonna cost. It costs money it, if we're gonna help people. And this is one thing I appreciate about Believer's Fellowship. We do a lot to help a lot of people, whether it's food, whether it's clothing, whether it's our benevolence funds, we do a lot to help a lot of people. And we can, I, I want to do more. As we grow, as the church is blessed, as we're all blessed, we ought to be increasing what we're doing so we can reach out more, so we can help more. When there's genuine needs that need to be met, we, we don't have to sit back and say, well, we can't afford to help. God forbid that that happens to us. But it does happen when people kind of run to the side and don't do what they, they're called to do. And, the, and they, you know, they develop this attitude about finances and giving that's, that's not biblical. They get lazier. They just don't give. It leads to churches today that I've seen that, that get foreclosed on or churches that are laying off staff or all these other adverse results that take place when people don't participate in the ministry that God has called them to participate. Then you start hearing stuff like, well, all that church wants is money. You heard that before, haven't you? Yeah. All they want is money. Yeah. I got some, some, some information I need to give you. You might want to keep this to yourself. But when you go down to Walmart down there, all they want is your money. That's it. All they want is your money. And they'll do everything they can from advertising to having sweet, welcoming people at the door, you know, to people to bag up your stuff, or whatever it might be. I don't, I don't know how to break this. They just want your money. In fact, if you don't give them the money, they'll have you arrested. You try to walk out of there without paying, you see what happens. We don't do that. It's not all about money for us. It's all about money for them. In fact, uh, y'all know what LinkedIn is? LinkedIn's kind of a business network, kind of like Facebook, but it's about business relations stuff. Uh, about several, eight months ago, I, I kind of, I, I, I did that thing. I, I haven't done it with Facebook, and I, I'm not a Twitter yet, a tweeter, or a twit, whatever. Hopefully none of those things. But uh, I, I, I clicked LinkedIn, and I put my name on LinkedIn and stuff. Well, then people that knew me started, you know, okay, you need to be connected to this person, connected, yeah, connect, 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 connect. And then I started noticing uh, this endorsements. Some of y'all are familiar with that. You can, you can endorse somebody for something. And I started getting endorsements. He's endorsed to be a preacher. He's endorsed to be the, he's endorsed teacher. He's endorsed in apologetics. He's endorsed, he's endorsed. And this is my favorite. He's endorsed it. I've been endorsed on LinkedIn for fundraising. <laughs> we don't even pass a plate here. In fundraising, we don't, we don't bring in these outside groups called campaign Financial campaign places, stewardship campaign, where you bring in an outside corporation and they come in and they tell you how to do the offerings and they tell you how to raise money and they tell you how to pay off the others and do that. But of course, they always want about 20% of it, whatever you're going to raise. So the Capital Campaign Investment Corporation, we don't even bring them in. In fact, we just ask you to pray and do what God wants you to do. Anytime there's been a time to raise some funds for something, we just say, do what God tells you to do. Isn't it amazing how God does that? Yes. The last thing that anybody that visits this church ought to feel is some big pressure to give something. I don't think that's what happens around here on Sunday. But what happens is God meets the need. And what happens is people are learning how to give. And what happens is people learn how to give excitingly. And people are experiencing the grace of God in their giving. But it is important that we are givers nonetheless. God's called us this. And unfortunately, it takes money to do what God's called us to do. I shared with the Magnolia campus this morning. I said, it takes one Sunday of the month's offering. It takes one whole offering this month just to pay the insurance on that property for that, for that service. You know? It takes, you know, you know what the electric bills are around here? You know, you know what they are at your house. Just multiply it by 10, you know, whatever it might be. Thousands of dollars just for that kind of stuff. 
But, but you know, we, we'd like to have air conditioning in the service. We'd like to have air conditioning for our ministries that function, for youth and children, all the things that we're doing. Amen. It'd be nice to have all those kind of things. So we know it takes finances. So never get to that point in your life where that you think you're going you're gonna to hinder somebody because you're not going to give. Boy, that's a dangerous territory to enter into your life. Amen. You want to stay free in your giving and free in your life. Number 10, drum roll, please. <laughs> Thank you. Don't reach out to people who are unchurched. And by unchurched, that falls into two categories of people. People are, who, who perhaps are, love the Lord, but they've been out of church, all right? And now they're just not really going anywhere. And number two, people who don't know the Lord, who need Jesus Christ. This is the place to bring them. This is the place where the gospel is preached. This is the place where we're lifting up Jesus Christ. We're exalting his word. This is the place where lots of Christians are, are going to embrace them and care for them and love them. The primary purpose that we have is, one, to introduce people to Jesus Christ. Two, is to disciple them in their life with Jesus Christ. This is the way that God has designed it, all right? That we are reaching the world. We, the church, we, we go out like many churches into the culture during the week. We come back, we celebrate as a large group together each week. And in doing that, it's not just about me and my family and what I get. Do I like this or not? No, I want to be a part of something that's bigger than myself. The kingdom of God, reaching people for the kingdom of God, reaching out to people. If, you, if you're living like an island, kind of isolated and off to yourself, you're not enjoying your Christian life the way you should be. There is joy in reaching people. Just ask Jesus. He thought it was a good idea. He did it. He died for them. And he's given to us the same mission. Reach the lost. Care for people. Love people. Reach out to people. Invite people. Bring people. If you want to kill your church, the easy way to do it is just don't do that. Church life in general has a, what we call an attrition rate. They just kind of a fall off rate. You lose in your church population annually by several means of about 5 to 6%. Some people pass on. All right? They're not coming back to church. They're with Jesus. They're not interested in coming back here. Hopefully, amen. Two is some people backslide. You know some of them? They're backsliding. They're not interested in getting right with God. Hey, the day's coming. We, we continue to love on them. Be patient with them. God's going to get a hold of them. You know, I don't have to beat them up. God will take care of that. That's right. I love them. I keep reaching out to them. Some people, back, some people get mad at you. Some people get mad at me. Well, I'm not going to church anymore. You know, and they leave. That's just a natural process. Wouldn't you agree that happens in, in life in general, in the, in the life of the church? And about 5 to 6% that happens every year. You're going to lose 5 to 6% of your population. That means that the church has to, if they're just going to maintain status quo, they've got to be reaching at least 5 or 6% of the people, that many more people every year every year to keep the church steady. But God never intended for us just to kind of plow ahead at the same rate, the same depth, all the same time. If you look at the kingdom of God, it's an ever-increasing, ever-growing. If you look at the kingdom of heaven, it's ever-increasing, ever-growing. If you look at the church, it's supposed to be increasing. And the Lord added to the church, the Bible said, daily. That happened how? Did he come down after he'd already gone up and go out and invite and knock doors and all that kind of No. The people went out. Jesus living in them reached out to them where they were, on their jobs, in their communities, in their neighbors, just going out and loving people. And because we love people, we want to see the very best for people, so we invite them to Jesus. That's the best thing that can happen to anybody. If you want to kill a church, don't reach out. Don't invite. Don't be concerned about other people. Churches need a constant, consistent transfusion of, of new life. People that are coming to Christ. People that are meeting Jesus. And people are coming to the fellowship. Don't kill your church, all right? Don't kill your church. Don't be guilty of that. You go out, you bring somebody in. You invite people to the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are the 10 ways you don't come. One, if you want to kill your church, just don't come. Number two, if you do come, come late, all right? Don't come when the weather's bad. That's another way to kill your church. In fact, let me just give you all 10 in a, in a, in a different format real quick, just to show you the points on how to build your church, because obviously the, re, the reverse is true. And it goes, the list is simple. Do come, do come on time. Be bigger than the weather. 
Look for the best. Be a doer of the word. Adopt a servant's heart. Be an encourager. Use your spiritual gift. Be a giver. Love people. Amen. Amen. That's how you build a church. As an individual, our responsibility as the church, preach the word, lift up Jesus, exalt the cross, praise God for the blood, worship Jesus. Amen. That's what we're seeking to do. That's our heart's desire. But if you look at that list, Jesus did the whole list. Of course, he built the church. It's his bride, but he built it because he came. And by the way, he came on time. The Bible says in the fullness of time that the Son of God was manifest. What's that mean? When it was time. When it was time, he was there. When it was time, you would have to look for him. When it was time, he showed up. Be bigger than the weather. Look for, he, he, all this is him. He was not only the word, he was the doer. He certainly had a servant's heart. He certainly spent his time encouraging. He certainly used what God had given him as his God's son. He was the ultimate giver and he still loves lost people. By the way, according to Colossians 1, 18, he's still the head of the church. He's still the Lord of the body. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is supposed to have first place in everything. In fact, he not only loves the church, the Bible says this is the way in Ephesians 3.10, it says that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church, to the rulers, to authorities, in the heavenly places. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is not only revealing himself to the world through us, the church, he's revealing himself to principalities and powers, and that speaks about wicked dominions and rulers. He's showing that he's still God, he's still Lord, He's still on the throne. He still has a people. There's still a remnant that love Christ and want to make a difference for God. We are his bride. Many times when I come back from mission trips and stuff, especially to Eastern Europe, I share with you about pastors I met and the, the testimonies they've shared with me about suffering and being imprisoned and being beaten or families being beaten in prison or killed. You know, Dr. Nicole, you know, who lost her father, who was a pastor. The communists killed him, killed her mother, killed her brother a couple of days before the Iron Curtain fell. Because they were ministers of the gospel. They paid the price. Now, let me say, something that astounded me, these men loved Jesus, you know, and they were willing to pay a price. Their families loved Jesus. Not only for Christ, but they loved the church. They were willing to go to death, if necessary, to jail, to be beaten repeatedly for the church. They were told they couldn't do the, do church. They were told they couldn't preach the word of God. They were told they had to meet certain governmental standards. They refused all that and did what God wanted them to do. They could have easily said, I love Jesus, but I'm not going to do this church chain. It's too costly. But the church, even through persecution, even through difficulty, through crisis, not only at that time, but the very first century church that suffered so much and so many people gave their lives blood for, that church still moves on today. Because people were willing to be what God wanted them to be. We have been given a much softer mission field, a much easier task in so many ways. We ought to be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the total goal of what Jesus is doing with the church and through the church and by the church. Instead of sitting back and saying, well, I don't want to do much. I, I don't want to be counted among the, that, that class of folks. And I feel, I feel so small and so little when I meet with these pastors and their families or the, what's left of their families and they share some of their stories. I feel so small. I remember sitting in a, in a, a little a pastor's home in Hisar, Bulgaria. And he invited me to have dinner with him. We're sitting down there eating and his son is translating while we're sitting there. And such a sweet man of God telling me stories that, you know, of experiences that they had. In fact, he, he got up from the dinner table and took me to a, to a, to a fireplace where it was a, a stone fireplace. And he pulled out a stone where, and behind it was a little hiding place. And he told me this is where we would hide our Bibles because there'd be often we'd be sitting at dinner and the KGB soldiers would break in the door and, you know, and to try to carry us off to prison or find Bibles just to, to take away our Bibles. He said, I have a new place I've prepared now for when they come again. If they come again, I'm ready where I'll hide the Bible. I thought, you know, where are we in America? How much do we love our Bible? We just leave it behind everywhere. How much time do we spend in our Bible? How much do we love the church? 
Will we be willing to meet in secret places or go down to the river in the dark of night, not lighting flashlights or candles for fear of being found out to have a baptismal service in the dark in ice cold waters? Get down into Mexico and Central America or many of you have been me. You've met those people in those little villages who walk miles just to get to church on Sunday morning and meet under, not in beautiful air conditioning, but under a little palapa roof with a hot Caribbean sweltering humidity and sun coming down and walk all the way back home. I love this church. I want you to know I love his church. And I think all of us do in our hearts, but we need to express it in our lives and not be guilty, you know, of being a church killer. Not being someone who's going to destroy what Jesus has given his life for. That we would see the same importance because, folks, God's given us a, a tremendous place of responsibility. You could have been born anywhere at any other time. God had you right here. In fact, it's a unique time for us as a church. This whole area is being revitalized. This whole area, is, I mean, the economy was sapped out and now things are starting to change a little bit and the restructuring of things. There's thousands of homes. There's supposed to be like 15,000 new families here in the next few years. What are we going to do to reach them? God's blessed us to be right here for such a time as this. Let's do it. Amen. Amen. Let's renew our commitment to it. Let's renew our passion for it, our vision for it. We're the lifesavers. We're the rescue line. We have the answers. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Things are upside down more than they've ever been. People are going to start looking for answers again. We need to be the ones ready on the front lines with the aid that's necessary through the Word of God to meet needs and change lives. Don't you want to be a part of that? Yeah. I want to embrace that with all my heart and rise to the vision that God's given us to meet these people in this community, in this world that God's given us to meet. Let's don't miss this opportunity. Would you stand with your heads bowed? As those children, uh, one of which is his own, so he gets that Only privilege this anymore. morning. So, Brother Gary. <laughs> right. Well, good morning. I have Robert Hanning coming down, and uh, he's got some things that he wants to share. I'm going to ask him a question, and he'll answer the question. Robert, when did you decide to give your... When were you saved, Robert? Before we don't get it. Uh, last year at camp. And why did you decide, decide to give your, your uh, life to Christ? So when I die, I can go to heaven. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Hold your nose. Robert, with your profession of faith, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. <laughs> Next, it's an honor to uh, be able to baptize my son, Aiden. Aiden, come on down. Don't touch the microphone. Aiden, do you have something to say? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I gave my life to Christ at camp because I know where I'm going to go when I die. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you hold your nose. Son, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. All right. Thank you. Amen. All right, God. Amen. That bless your heart. Amen. Amen. If that didn't bless you, you got